Hey everybody, we're going to talk about OCaml today. Maybe you've never written it, maybe you've seen me talk about it on Twitter, maybe you're an OCaml star and that's why you're here. Whatever the case may be, we're just going to chat about it today and we're going to use the context of this wonderful book, Writing Interpreter and in Go, which you can see behind me. By the way, you can use promo code THEPRIMAGEN for 30% off. And we're just going to talk about the very first chapter. We'll do maybe approximately one video per chapter, although for some of the later chapters, we may need a little bit more space or time to sort of work out how we're solving the problems. But I just want to walk you through my solutions in OCaml and see if you like it. We can chat about it, leave a comment, etc., and just see where this takes us. So I hope you enjoy, and I'm excited to talk to you all about it. Let's get to it. So I actually struggled a little bit with where to start here. There's a lot to explain in OCaml, especially if you're used to more C style based syntax and type systems and all this other stuff. So I'm going to try and explain as we go. If something doesn't make sense, hopefully I'll explain it later. Or you can ask in the comments and maybe I can bring that up in a follow up video. If you're really interested in learning OCaml sort of more holistically, let me know and maybe I can make some videos more specifically about OCaml syntax, type system, modules, etc. But we're going to try and focus mostly on just the bits that are important for us to know today. So I decided it would be cool to start with these interface files. Interface files are a way of telling the rest of your OCaml program, hey, here's what my module is going to do and the functions and types available to you. So the first thing that we define is we define this type T. This is in our lexer for the interpreter book. The interpreter book basically goes through three phases. You have a lexer, then you have a parser, and then you have an evaluator. The lexer at the beginning just takes a string and then gives you tokens. Now tokens are not actually checked for semantically if they make sense of the program or anything like that. That all happens in the next phase in the parser. This just takes a string and then basically adds types to it so that we can work with them much more easily instead of just passing around some string. So the lexer's job is to take a string and give us tokens. And this basically lays out what we have here. You can sort of write this implementation with that in mind. We have a type T and the actual internals of the type are hidden. This is just something that I thought was really cool and wanted to include here. You can see that the actual type T has something like an input string, a position int, and some optional char, which is the current char that we're on. But we're hiding that. We're not letting anyone outside of this module access those or touch them or even know what they are or do anything with them. It's all just hidden. It's just a type T. This type T, by the way, is sort of an idiom that you'll see in a lot of OCaml projects as sort of a way to hint to the reader that, hey, this is our primary type for the module. You're going to do stuff with this and all of the functions kind of revolve around this idea. So we have this type T and effectively it's a private type. You can't see it. So that means other people need a way to construct our type. That's what this init function will do. It's not a special function. There's no special magic happening. We just use init because it's quite helpful to think about as an initializer. And this takes a string and gives a lexer. Now, one thing that I think is cool is I actually implemented this uh, not the same exact way that's done in the book because in the book there is mutability and the lexer continually gets updated inside of itself, which is perfectly fine. It's whatever. I'm not saying you can't ever write programs with mutability. What I wanted to explore, can we write this without any mutability so that every time we get a new token, we effectively return a new lexer state and that lexer state sort of chomps its way through returning tokens as we go. So that's what we do here. You can see this next token. If you're not super familiar with the syntax, I'll just explain it right here. This T here is the input parameter to our function. And what we return is a T. So that's going to be the new T. That's the new lexer. And we have a token option. Now our token, we'll just do a quick detour, hop over to here. Our token is basically, these are called variants. You might be familiar with them being called like, enums and rust or maybe some sort of tagged union in typescript uh, the names vary a lot but effectively these variants are saying hey this t can either be illegal or it can be an ident and when you see of and then a type this says this ident can hold something so when we look for something with these idents later in the project you'll see that we actually do something like oh we say this ident holds a five in this case all right that's what's going on there we have integer and then we have all these operators, delimiters, keywords, okay? There's nothing too exciting happen, happening there except that what's cool is we can make a type T and then we can define these variants and those are the only variants that are allowed to be part of that T. 
So we, when we pattern match against them, we can get exhaustive pattern matching. We get a bunch of other benefits and we don't have to sort of hold them in like stringly typed land, right? It's, it's a really powerful enum, if maybe that, that helps you. So what we have is this next token returns a new lexer and optionally a token. If you're not familiar with that, that basically means it's going to either have some token or it's going to have none. Those are your two options, <laughs> right? Uh, and when we get none, that basically says, hey, there's no more tokens left in this file. We're all done. Uh, so we didn't need to encode or have all these checks for special types of tokens that might mean that we're finished. We actually can just encode this and then every place that we get this token option back, we have to handle whether the stream of tokens is done. So then basically it just makes it so that you don't have to remember it. The compiler will remember to make you handle it. And then lastly, it's just some pretty pretty functions. So what's cool is basically what we expose is we're just saying, hey, there's a way to init a new lexer and there's a way to take a lexer and get a new token. And that's all that this module does. So that's really great. Let's look at how this is actually implemented. So I mentioned before, here's what our type looks like. Uh, don't need to worry too about this. This is basically macros in OCaml, and this just defines a way for us to show this type for pretty printing it later. Um, here's our init function, and you might be thinking, TJ, what is happening here? There's no parentheses, there's no brackets. I don't know how to read this. Let me just translate this for you into what's basically happening. This is effectively like writing something, let init is function, and then it takes in some string input, and then what are we gonna do? We're gonna check if uh, string is empty, you know, of input, then we're gonna do something inside of here, okay? And you, you can kind of get the rest of the idea here. What's cool is we don't actually have to write these types. OCaml's compiler can check what the types are possibly and make sure that they match up either with our interface if it's available or if they just make sense within the file. So OCaml's type inference is powerful enough to do all of these things and then let us know that this function does indeed take in a string and return a T. I didn't write this line, this is a hint from the LSP. Uh, and the rest of this is just creating the type T record and filling in those fields as you would expect. Now, you're thinking, hey, what's up with this? I don't see any parentheses. How do you know that the function is calling? Whenever we have an identifier and then other identifiers or expressions coming after it, that's going to be a function and these are its parameters. So this is just the same as calling this string dot is empty input. When you're reading my code here, wherever there's yellow, that means it's a function call or a function definition. If that helps you at all, it might help you as we're reading through. So that's what init does, nothing too exciting. What I wanna show that I think where things start to get a little bit cute, let's say, that I'm excited about is this next token function. What happens here, remember this takes in a lexer and it's gonna return a new lexer and then optionally some token. Um, in the book, what we do is we have to skip white space here. We can go look at the definition of this and you can see that we're doing something where we're just looking through the lexer and we're gonna basically skip if this thing is white space. Otherwise, we're gonna stop skipping and return the lexer and we return an updated one. So this is where things are a little bit different from the book if you're familiar or with maybe how you'd write this in another language we actually return a new lexer each time that we do this. This is because we didn't define any of the fields as mutable in OCaml. You can actually define fields as mutable like this, and then you could change the position and you could change the character, but you couldn't change the input. So that's just a cool, I think like type level thing that's really interesting about OCaml, but we didn't do that. Instead, what we're gonna do is it's, you can effectively think of the lexer as like the lexer state, and we're gonna return a new state each time, and then we're gonna do something on it. This makes the function in my mind really easy to reason about, because you can always see when something might change the lexer, because you can't actually, um, you can't update the lexer inside of any functions without returning it. So what do I mean, right? In this case, if we didn't return this lexer here and we just returned, um, you know, like let copy equals lexer in here and then we returned copy, this would be really weird. I don't know why you would use this, uh, write the code like this, but then this effectively does nothing. We're not gonna skip the white space. We're gonna still be on the white space when we're done. We know that only functions that return a lexer can advance the lexer and that's why we do this. So then this line, let open token, what this means is actually that we're going to basically say, hey, whatever's in this module 
can you kind of expose this in the following scope? Now we don't actually have to do this. If we remove this, it would say, hey, none of these make sense. I can actually just put token here and the rest of these would follow because it kind of knows where they are. But I prefer this sort of idea within this function. We're gonna write a bunch of the different variants for token. So we're gonna open it here. You could also put this at the top. That would be just fine as well. The next step that we're gonna do is we're gonna start using OCaml's pattern matching. At the beginning here, we're using very, very simple pattern matching. This kind of feature is available in lots of other languages and gaining a lot of popularity um, as time goes on. But as we get through this series, we're gonna see some more advanced use cases of pattern matching. And that's when I just think that's beautiful. So we'll work our way there though. We'll work our way there. Let's see what happens. So the first thing that you notice is we need to match the character of our lexer and see what we're gonna do. And we're gonna return the value here. So compare this to in the book for writing interpreter and in go, you have to check all the time whether particular objects are basically nil or some value. But the problem with that is you can forget to check whether something was nil. You can't forget to check to handle this because the um, the OCaml compiler will not let you advance until you've done this matching. So that's beautiful. And what this says is, hey, when we don't have a character, the next token's always just going to be none. So return the lexer, not advance, don't do anything with it, just return none. So if you keep on calling next token on the lexer when it's supposed to be finished, it's just going to keep on saying, I don't have any more tokens for you. I don't have any more tokens for you. What happens after this? In this case, what it says is, hey, does it match this pattern with some and then a character? Now we could rename this to anything we wanted it to be like, wow, there's nothing special about the name. If it's an identifier, then it's basically gonna assign the value of this to this wow. So now basically we have, okay, here's the current character that the lexer is on. What are we gonna do with that? Well, we're gonna match this character with whatever the current character is. And so this is how you'd write like literally characters, not strings in OCaml is use single quotes, double quotes will be a string. And now we can match against these. So what's interesting is we can see every single place that we're gonna advance the lexer. It moves the lexer one character further in its input. And so what we do is when we get a semicolon, hey, what are we gonna do? We're gonna advance the lexer and then we're gonna return our token is this semicolon. And we keep on going down, <clears throat> down this list and we can see each one matches really easily. All of these here are very simple, very straightforward. Where things start to get kind of cool is we see this function, if peaked. So if peaked is a function that I wrote that just basically says, hey, we have a lexer and we have a character that we're gonna check. If the, def the default character that we're gonna use, and notice this little tilde here, that's the way that you use named parameters. So we're gonna, the reason that I have that is it's not clear to me which one should come first and if peaked, uh, whether it should be the thing that gets matched or the default. So I just named them. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, hey, is the peaked character, when we have some peaked character, does it match, does it equal the character that we passed in? So this is where we start to see, oh, I really like this pattern matching. Because we can not only say that some peaked, some peaked character here, we can actually add a condition to this case, which is, hey, if it's, this is kind of like a really long if statement in some other language, say, if it's some character and the character equals this character, you maybe see this a lot in TypeScript where you have to check, oh, is this thing not undefined? And then does it have the thing? And then you have like eight different conditions just to check if something's equal to another thing. You can just do all of that in one line and then you're gonna advance the lexer and return the match one. Otherwise, underscore matches everything. We're just gonna return the lexer and the default value and then we advance the lexer to finish. So you can see that that's all we're doing here. So this is basically saying, hey, do we have not equals? If we have not equal, we're gonna return not equal. If it's just this bang and then nothing else, we're just gonna return bang. Same thing for this equals. And then that's sort of all of our very first cases. Now we're gonna use the same idea again of this additional case where we're gonna say, hey, is the next character an identifier where we check if it's equal to underscore if or if it's some is alpha character. Then we're gonna read an identifier. Read identifier just basically says, hey, let's read while this thing is an identifier. And then we just need to check and make sure whether this is a keyword or not. We once again use the match statements. And this is where you can start to see matches end up all over the place in OCaml. And I think they're very powerful because what they let you do 
is you can match against literal cases here, which is great. So this is kind of like a whole bunch of if else statements, except I think um, they're much more concise and they're forced to be the same types and you can make sure that you're handling all the different cases, etc. So we're going to match against whatever keywords we have and then we're going to return those. Notice that the type of this is still a token T. So what's cool is even though we have all these different variants, they're all the same type. It's not like you have a union of a bunch of different types. You have one type that contains all the possible variants. If I tried to return something that doesn't exist, does not exist or whatever, it's going to say, hey, dude, this, this was supposed to be T, but there's no constructor does not exist within this T. And so it won't let you do that. Ultimately, then what we see is that's pretty much the whole lexer. There's nothing else in here except for a few sort of functions that are just really simple things like here's how we're going to read while we're going to read this function. We're going to seek forward in the lexer until this condition doesn't count. And then when this condition counts, then we're going to return the string slice. OK, now that that might look really confusing. I might look really confusing at first, but just break it down line by line. First, we're going to the position start, which is our current position. We're going to seek forward in our the lexer gets passed to seek. And here's some function, basically an inline function that says whether we should continue seeking or not. So if there's no more characters, we're obviously going to be done. Otherwise, we're going to call our condition on this character. That's this uh, one of the values that gets passed in initially to this function. And then when we're done, we'll get the position end and we return our updated lexer state and some substring with this input with we start and then here's the length of the string that we're going to take. So there's there's nothing else basically in here. I, I don't know. Is this a fun video? Do you like this idea? Do you want me to explain more OCaml? Should I have done a whole OCaml course before you do this? I don't know. Give me your thoughts. Ultimately, I just wanted to show we're writing not that much code. I think it's really concise. I think it's really elegant. I'm having a lot of fun writing OCaml. We've been writing a lot on stream. Let me know. I just wanted to make a YouTube video showing all of you. So thanks everybody and have a great day.